It is our honor and proud privilege that we have today with us some of the gems in pulmonology. To begin with, um, I'm very happy to share with everyone that we had 867 registrations live for the live viewership of this event as of today morning. And by now we have 1042 logins. Thank you for being with us today. So this is a much awaited event. I would personally like to share with you the fact that I had been requesting Dr. Krishna to take time and come to North since the past eight, nine months. And finally, sir has taken out the time and he's here with us. Thank you, sir. Before we begin today's event, I would like to share that we are going to have a minute of silence as a tribute to Dr. Chandra Vadan Kantilal Vora, Dr. Agam Vora's father, a dedicated physician, pediatrician, and a loved and respected father and human being. Though he's not with us, but he lives on, for us at least, uh, within Dr. Agambora. A minute of silence for sir, please. Om Shanti. Thank you, Dr. Agam, sir, for being with us. It is an extraordinary show of strength and commitment towards CCI. This is invaluable. May I first of all invite Dr. N.H. Krishna, sir, to please come forward on the dais. May I request Dr. Amutha Kumar Ramasamy, sir, to please come forward for lamp lighting. May, doctor, may I request Dr. Agambora to please join us. May I request Raj to please assist in lamp lighting. We as doctors are forever learners and whoever guides us and helps us in this path of learning, we are indebted to them. And let us first of all pray to Almighty to be forever our guide. May I request esteemed dignitaries here, Dr. Hani Sani, Dr. Mandal, sir, Dr. Zafar, to please come forward for lamp lighting. May the light shine eternal in each one of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now invite Dr. N.H. Krishna to please share with us a few words on the inauguration of this event. Dr. N.H. Krishna is probably one of the most beloved 
patrons of pulmonology in india sir has brought together pulmonologists pan india and across the world like someone pulls together puts together pearls in a string but i think in this case it is not just pearls but all kinds of gems and diamonds precious semi precious stones flowers it's a beautiful garland that is cci and it has come about by tireless efforts of about 15 years and may i thank sir on behalf of each and every pulmonologist in india for bringing up cci as a platform for young and experienced both young and experienced pulmonologists sir please good evening everyone i prefer calling you all as my family and that is how cca was formed cca was formed with the tagline of one for all and all for one actually there is a popular saying that no job no experience and no experience no job i could notice this and i could notice this there are so many popular elders uh, they are very good in field even the youngsters they are very good in field but they were not coming into light academically i don't know whether someone had to tell them that you please come you can do this it is really only you can do this and a blending of seniors and juniors academically seniors to bless and juniors to take it further in indian pulmonology was highly essential so chest council of india was formed anybody can ask me that there are so many associations in the entire globe what extra with cci my only answer is all other associations this is a family so here everybody everybody to each other we are brothers sisters elders they are like our parents so this is the difference between the organization and cci today we have 3500 pulmonologists span india and nris who are the members of chest council of india chest council of india has been conducting webinars since the last two and a half years non stop every thursday guruvar ki raat guru ke sath and sometimes even three to four webinars in a week and this is a grand gala occasion wherein for the first time chest council of india is doing a hybrid cme which is not only attended by you physically here but already thousand and odd people are live watching us so this very new step the beginning of this new era has started with chandigarh thank you chandigarh today we have two fantastic speakers mera dost agam hai my dear friend arindam is coming so we other than uh, the speakers i would like to tell they are very good human beings and thank you so much kirat for making this happen with all your efforts and the entire chandigarh team thank you thank you so much long live chest council of india long live india jai shri krishna our first talk for the day will be taken by dr agamboram i happened to make the mistake of asking sir for his cv and sir is the extraordinary person he said he is he said just say i'm your dost and i'm a cci person but i was not quite satisfied i thought i should do my homework properly and i thought i should look up the internet and see what i can find 
So we all know, sir, is the West Zone CCI convener. Sir is currently the national secretary for the largest association of physicians of India, API. And he has various other things to his credit. But let me tell you, his CV was 64 pages long, full of all the things he's done, more than 10 fellowships, N number of publications, N number of memberships. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, sir, for being here with us today. On one hand, you introduce me as part of the family and the other hand, you want to read my CV. How does that go? That doesn't go well. As Krishna said, CCI is family and amongst my family members. Thank you, Karit, for making it happen. Thanks, Krishna, for conceptualizing Chest Council of India. I remember those days when CCI was just two or three small WhatsApp group with 100 odd people. And today I'm so happy to see that CCI has grown into multiple groups. You want something? Oh, yeah. May I invite the chairpersons for this session, please? Dr. Zafar sir and Dr. Deepak Agarwal. Dr. Zafar is consultant pulmonologist at Fortis Mohali. Dr. Deepak Agarwal is from consultant from GMC 32. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Zafar Bhai. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. So I was saying, and I'm so happy that CC has grown into one huge platform with, as Krishna said, the latest number somewhere around 3,000, 3,500 people, not only limited to cities, not only limited to metros, not only limited to country, but it has crossed boundaries and we are now a global platform, a platform that gives opportunity to everybody, be it a youngster, be it a probably a mature speaker like me, or be it a fantastic speaker, Arindam, who's going to be joining us. And we are loved by all. So I'm, I'm so happy that I'm here today. The topic that is given to me is uh, Krishna has a habit of giving very difficult topics and makes you work hard for that. I was just saying, in as he said, every weekly program, and trust me, kitne program hoye Krishna, and then not a single program repeated, not a single topic repeated, not a single uh, you know concept repeated for for weeks together. I did not know our pulmonology could have so many topics to discuss and that heads off to you. So he chose to give me a topic where MDR infections, choosing and reserving cephalosporin advantage was the topic given to me. And since I couldn't really rise up to the expectations, I thought I would twist the topic a bit and I'm going to take you to the cephalosporin that we started working on about... Uh, <coughs> five, six years ago, which was, again, the brainchild of my teacher, Professor Director Dr. K.C. Mohanty. And he looked at this particular molecule with two aspects. The one aspect was the time to recovery, how soon your patients recover. I mean, that's the problem we face in our COPD practice. And second is time to next exacerbation, whether your next exacerbation could be delayed with the right choice of antibiotic with so-called as eradication of bugs. So I'm going to take you to that. The next 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to spend on that. And I must, at the outset, express my sincere thanks to my teacher, late Professor Director Dr. K.C. Mohanty. In fact, the first ever meeting of CCI, physical gathering of CCI happened at uh, Mumbai, right? This happened at NAPCON, where Mohanty sir was the chairman. Is that so? I mean, the first uh, first ever meeting of uh, CCI, we gathered for the first time at, no, that was the conference, but we informally met at uh, NAPCON? Possibly, right? And and that was under Dr. Mohanty's uh, chairmanship. Of course, CCI for uh, giving me so much of love, Krishna in particular, Amuta. I met Amuta to CCI and I'm your fan. I had the pleasure of meeting you even at Mumbai and currently Amuta is going 
hospitals after hospitals and i'm told there is a fantastic state of the heart hospital coming up in chennai and i'm here to visit that i'm going to visit that hospital soon of course the office bearer of cci that's uh, ashish anil narayan pradeep correct of course uh, for getting all of us together are in the my co speaker who's uh, going to be decide who's going to be talking on one more interesting new molecule team zuventus my association with zuventus is almost uh, a decade decade and a half old and aditya alad is not here dr bupesh divan their medical head and of course the ceo mr pk goa all of you for sparing your valuable time to be here on this evening i'm extremely grateful to you for uh, showing my father's picture on screen and i wanted to dedicate this talk to him my father was my hero dr agarwal he taught me to be a hero you don't have to be you know the most handsome you don't have to have six pack body you don't have to wear rolex you don't have to drive mercedes you don't have to wear ribbon so whatever whatever all you have to do is to make a small difference in life of people around you he had his own set of problems you know like any other family would have my father lost his mother at the age of 6 or 7 and uh, we had a stepmother though she was a wonderful lady my father could probably had could never adjust well with her and uh, he developed uh, he started losing weight he became malnourished my my grandfather used to say that he started developing asthma since then and then probably was asthmatic all throughout as probably life progressed he had variety of diseases name the disease krishna and my father had it he had blood pressure he had diabetes he had vitiligo which i am inheriting from him he had osteoporosis cataracts peripheral neuropathies skin amyloidosis he had renal failure he had asthma to asthmatic bronchitis and asthma so you pretty overlap what you see he developed he developed sleep apnea he developed type 1 respiratory failure he had parkinsonism he had a variety of things i even forget but you will always find him smiling he had a signature smile on his face you could see that he was on wheelchair at that time this is just 4 days before we lost him this was a picture taken there was a small function at my house and i would say that he was a perfect father zafar bhai he was a perfect father he was a great social worker he was a human doctor always helpful my mom must be listening so he was a obedient husband as well and absolutely down to earth person krishna every sunday for almost 30 years i found him in one of the other rural areas doing some medical camps attending some schools looking at orphan children looking at old men's house etc and trying to help them medically socially offering them hand offering them ears listening to their problems and spending time with them so many incidences i remember when i think about him i'm going to tell you a few <clears throat> as a father i was about 12 years old arindam i had a friend of mine who was builder you know the very affluent family we were like lower middle class i would say we were lower class actually and uh, we went for diwali shopping and he bought trousers worth 800 900 rupees those time mumbai trousers would be about 100 120 rupees i bought two trousers worth 400 rupees and i went home mom was furious at me you can't buy trousers 400 what are you doing you are getting carried away by your friends and this is not the way and i was like father would get angry father comes home at about 839 and uh, i very sheepishly go to him and i tell him and he said ha ah, you bought trousers what about matching shirts you should have bought matching shirts as well and this is somewhere around 40 50 years old story which is still stuck in my mind i remember when i lost my first ever nokia mobile phone costing about 2110 model i still remember 26500 rupees that time and uh, i came home crying amuta hostel say it was lost stolen i come home crying and my father says my son's tears are far more precious than 
the phone that you've lost. Think about the next model that you want to buy. And we were not, we were, we were like lower middle class, 26,500 is today also that costly. I'm talking about that time. So these are the memories I have uh, of my father. And when I became consultant, where I started practice, he said across me, Arindam, for the first time, he said across me and told me, any patient that comes to you, you will treat him as your family member, as if you're treating your father, as if you're treating your mother, as if you're treating your brother. Please don't ask for any unnecessary tests if you don't feel are relevant. Don't look at those hidden benefits. Don't look at those interests that otherwise you, you may indulge into over time. And probably those things were stuck in my mind and whatever I am today, it's all because of the training, the teaching, the values that he taught me. And I'm so grateful to him for all the love, all the care that he gave me. And only one request I have for God, if given chance, if there is life after death, and if I get to choose my father, I want him as my father. And I thank all of you for all your loves, all your wishes, all your blessings, all your sympathies that you've given me in last one week. I'm sure wherever he is, he's at peace. With those words, let's start the show. And the Kirit told me Chandigarh. And I said, yeah, Chandigarh. Immediately I Googled. I said, what is Chandigarh all about? And I realized Chandigarh is a dream city. Arindam and we were just talking on the way when we were coming from the airport. It is the dream city of first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and were designed by the French design architect Le Corbusier. It is, it is located at the foothills of Shivalik Hill and it is the best example of the experiments in urban planning and modern architecture. It is a planned city. It is a district and a union territory which serves as joint capital of two neighboring states and that's Punjab and Haryana. And the name is derived from Chandi and Gra. Chandi is the Chandi, Chandi Devi temple that we have in Gar is the fortress. And this is Chandigarh all about. And when I think of Chandigarh, I think of Mansa Devi temple. I've been to the temple twice. I couldn't go to Chandi, Chandi Devi temple yet, but I've been to Mansa Devi temple on the, I wanted to go today, but flight got delayed. When I think of Chandigarh, I remember PGI. When I think of Chandigarh, I remember Dr. S.K. Jindal because Dr. Jindal was the examiner and where I go, it's not hard to other. Correct. Me and my wife both gave exams together, DNB exam. I flunked twice and my wife cleared it in first shot. And it was such a difficult situation to go home when my grandmother would look at it. You failed? And I say, yes. And Dr. Jindal was the examiner. Though he asked very good questions, I couldn't answer them, but then still. And then my ego knew no bounds. When I get invitation in 2007, when NAPCON was hosted in Chandigarh, and I get a letter from Dr. Jindal asking me to give a guest talk, and then I felt, ah, abhi barabar hai. So then Chandigarh has those memories with me. When I think of Chandigarh, I think of Rock Garden, I think of uh, Rose Garden, I think of Dolls Museum, I think of sectors and those beautiful big roads, and no panwala, no bidiwala. And I'm told by 25th, there'll be going to be complete ban on pan bidis. So, Thank God. I almost lost heart when they told me there will be no Panwala, no Bidiwala on the street. But that's what Chandigarh is about. With that, uh, COPD. COPD is a common disease worldwide with significant mortality and morbidity, posing major health problem and economic burden. And if I make very rough calculation, kills 3 million people every year, third leading cause of death. If we make very rough calculation with 3 million deaths would mean 8,200 deaths a day, would mean 340 deaths every hour, which would mean 5 deaths every minute. By the time we finish our discussion, maybe 30, 40 people would have died because of COPD exacerbation. That is what we are talking about. And everybody would agree this is under number. And if so, probably 10 patients every minute is what we are losing. Acute exacerbations contribute substantially to COPD mortality. We believe in our country, we have about 5% in male to 2.7% in female is what is the prevalence of COPD. I was looking at infections. So what, what I'm seeing in my OPD, and I'm sure everybody here would by and large be seeing the same, is last 100 patients data I tried to pull in. And I see about 12 patients out of that 100 I had for upper respiratory tract infection. And rest were lower respiratory. About seven had healthy lung, but majority had underlying unhealthy lung and about 76% of them were elderly. 
And what I mean by unhealthy lung, your old tuberculosis and interstitial lung disease and patients on steroids and immunosuppressive therapies. But the commonest chunk in my practice is COPD, 40 out of those 100. And what common bugs I am seeing in a small area in Mumbai called Burivali is common bugs, streptococci, mixed gram positive. In spite of best possible ways to find out bugs responsible, you may not be successful in majority and you may not get any bug. Gram negative, if you have underlying bad COPDs, ILDs, the patient is on a lot of immunosuppressive drugs or if patient gets multiple exacerbations in past, Clipshell and Pseudomonas, tough bug, then yes, you do see tuberculosis as well. With that, exacerbation is defined as episodes of increased respiratory symptoms, that is dyspnea, cough and sputum production and maybe increased purulence. This includes increase in cough, both in frequency and severity, sputum which increases in volume or it changes its character and there is worsening of breathlessness. Trust me, you don't need fever for it to be included at acute exacerbation. And we all had problems with the definition because it had a lot of shortcomings. I'm sure everybody here would agree when I say this, that it relies exclusively on patients' subjective perceptions of increased respiratory symptoms. Wife would come and tell you, in my Gujarati. And he said, no, 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 I'm fine. My cough is the same. The patient's and wife probably's presentation or the complaints would be different. It does not relate the symptoms to measurable pathophysiological variables. And it did not have the time frame in the sense it could go on for months together. There was no objective definition. And hence, the newer guideline, the newer update, the 23 gold states the exacerbation as it is the exacerbation is defined as event characterized by increase in dyspnea, end or cough production, I mean end or cough and sputum production, which is worse in less than 14 days, which may be accompanied by tachypnea, tachycardia and is often associated with increased local and systemic inflammation which may be caused by infection, pollution or other insults to airways. So it gives you time frame and it gives you subjective things like tachycardia, tachypnea and it also gives you idea about how would you diagnose and assess where you would complete a thorough clinical assessment to rule out pneumonia as heart failure, pulmonary embolism, other differential which could give you this kind of presentation, assess symptom severity and look at signs of tachycardia, tachypnea, look at the sputum color volume, evaluate severity by using additional investigations like pulse oximetry, like lab assessment, CRP, blood gases and establish the cause of the event which may be viral, bacterial or other. So this is what is the definition today. And how would you manage exacerbation? Of course, you would treat them with the bronchodilators, your labalama combination. There is a evolving role of steroids. So you have now A, B, C, D is gone and you have now A, B, E classifications. You would look at giving steroids, not giving steroids, inhaled. But systemic steroids, yes, would definitely improve uh, the, the symptoms faster. will have short recovery time. And antibiotics, as and when needed, can definitely reduce the recovery time reduce the risk of early relapse and treatment failure and we've got decent evidence that is evidence level B for that. The exacerbations are divided as mild, moderate or severe where you have fairly decent preserved lung function about FEV1 of 50 and above, no respiratory failure, less relatively exacerbations a year, moderate would have uh, slightly lower lung functions and severe will have even lower lung functions. Most of these mild exacerbations can be managed at home with slight changes in their inhaler therapy and uh, moderate would require systemic corticosteroids plus minus antibiotics and severe would obviously require hospitalization. Clinically, you would recognize this exacerbation as worsening dyspnea, cough which increases in severity and frequency and sputum which increases in viscosity, volume, character. If there are various scales available. You may also look at chest tightness and discomfort, which may help you identify the exacerbation. Look at constitutional symptoms, reduction in pulmonary function test and other investigations like chest x-ray, where if there is consolidation, probably the line of treatment would be different. Coming down to etiology, 
75 percent of your exacerbations are going to be infection related less than one fourth would be other causes where infection may not be the precipitating factor and you have eosinophilic inflammation pollution and unknown etiology outdoor pollution indoor pollutions certain other environmental parameters like uh, lower ambient temperatures etc winter season and low humidity are confirmed triggers for acute exacerbation bacteria bacterial infections trigger one third to one half copd exacerbation so you have 100 exacerbations 75 are due to infection if you have 75 exacerbations one half to one third of them would be because of bacterial infections common bugs streptococci morexella h influenza pseudomonas and others would be depending on patient's underlying conditions comorbidities number of antibiotics received in past and we now believe it is due to acquisition of a new bacterial strain which plays central role in pathogenesis of exacerbation rather than increase in the concentration of colonizing bacteria we were initially thinking that initially i mean sorry we were initially thinking that increase in the concentration of bug is responsible for development of exacerbation we now realize is the new strain new bacterial strain that patients airway acquire leads to exacerbation when we look at viruses yes about uh, one third to two thirds of the exacerbation could be viral the commonest virus is rsv we have of course covid can give you this influenza can give you this and there are hell lot of new viruses which we are picking up because of thanks to this newer multiplex pcr we are able to pick them uh, you know those viruses and most of these viruses have a doubtful role in exacerbation but then there are certain viruses for example like influenza if you pick up influenza it is never a common cell it is never a colonizer there and you have influenza if you pick up influenza that is the bug responsible for that exacerbation when it comes to acb interestingly or typical bugs are hardly responsible so you have pneumonias almost different studies would talk about say uh, 17 18 to 25% of those community acquired pneumonias could be because of or typical bugs but when it comes to acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis or typical bugs have hardly any role to play you may see co infections you may see viral infections beginning and then soon gets secondarily infected with streptococci and uh, 15 days down the line rhinovirus streptococcal infection is not uncommon evaluating for infection is critical because your choice of antibiotics or initiation of antibiotic would depend on that and there are various criteria various algorithms various uh, you know clinical evaluations would help you judge that sputum prevalence is important factor do so you have a prevalence in sputum though it is not the hallmark but yes it could it could guide you choose the antibiotic and when you have all three symptoms present when you have patients uh, you know dyspnea sputum production and the sputum prevalence which is increased all three criteria present 80% chances that that is infection related if it is only two out of this three symptom chances at 35% that it would be infection related and if it is only one symptom probably only 6% chances that it is infection related we have variety of statements which tell you to start antibiotic and you have ers ats joint statement which say that administration of antibiotics antibiotic selection should be based upon local sensitivity patterns and studies suggest that episodes with prevalent sputum are most likely to benefit however there may be other considerations when deciding whether or not to prescribe an antibiotic and we have our joint recommendation that is ics nccp recommendation we say that antibiotics should be prescribed for all exacerbations of copd and uh, the choice should be guided by local flora and sensitivity pattern but it says fluoroquinolones must be avoided and i'm sure all chest physicians all of us do agree to that and we prefer not to use fluoroquinolones in these exacerbations what to use patients with acute exacerbation who meet criteria for antibiotic therapy must have antibiotics which has got adequate coverage for common respiratory bugs that is h influenza and morexella and streptococci coverage for or typical is generally not required and patients who have got more advanced disease or when there is a possibility of pseudomonas or etc must be given antibiotics accordingly i got chance to publish a paper in japi this came probably 10 years ago and we were looking at commonly prescribed antibiotic for copd exacerbations and trust me amoxicillin clavulanic 
acid combinations you have it available in various dosages right from 2 is to 1 amoxicillin to clavulanic to 16 is to 1 combinations and insufficient dosages and inappropriate combinations could lead to disaster macrolides have an advantage of associated anti inflammatory immunological activity as well but streptococci in in my area at least have got about 20 22% resistance to macrolide monotherapy and hence you may use macrolide as a add on therapy but only using macrolide as a therapy for COPD exacerbation may not be successful and we all have seen rampant use of macrolide during this COVID time. I am sure there must not be anybody who has not received macrolide during this last one and a half to two years that may add to the problems uh, you know once we do further more studies and fluoroquinones we are reserving. That leaves you with very limited choice. I looked at another study my some 500 patients data and I said there is no resistance to penicillin. The penicillin is still sensitive. Only thing is all these bugs are now ESBL producers. So you can't use penicillin alone. You have to have uh, ESBL inhibitor with you. You can't use amoxicillin and ampicillin alone. You may have to have a clavulanic acid or any other ESBL inhibitor with it. Macrolide, significant resistance to gram positive bugs, mainly streptococci. And uh, wherever there is GI intolerance of patients who do not tolerate amoxicillin well or penicillin well, your cephalosporin could be a good choice. With that, I'll come to the cephalosporin that we studied probably for the last five, six, seven years. So, Sergitorin is the advanced third generation broad spectrum cephalosporin with its unique structure. It is available for more than 20, 30 years in the international market, and we also have it for about 20 years now. 20 years? 20 years now in our country. And I'm proud to say that uh, probably the suspension form is only available in our country. It's not available anywhere globally, right? So, that's that's what is cephalosporin about. This is uh, the structure of the molecule that we are talking about, that's sevditorin. So like any other cephalosporin, it has a beta lactam ring there with seven position uh, on its seven position, which is responsible for cell wall synthesis inhibition. Cephalosporin would act by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis. You have T aminothiazole group here, which is responsible for enhanced gram negative coverage. You have methyl thiazoline group which is responsible for enhanced gram positive coverage and you have a pivoxyl group there which is hydrolyzed by esterase in the intestinal wall resulting in enhanced bioavailability of this drug and what is beauty is if you have this drug after full meal fat stuffed meal your drug absorption could be high by s by 20 25 percent tmax about three hours after the dosing and has got terminal half-life of about two hours what is interesting is it is widely distributed and penetrates into bronchial mucosa, epithelial lining fluid, skin blister fluid, tonsillar tissues, maxillary sinus mucosa, skin tissues, tooth extraction wounds and clinically relevant concentrations are achieved just in 4 hours and you can see that. Tissue concentrations compared to serum concentration 54% higher than the serum concentration you will find in bronchial mucosa, 31% higher in epithelial lining fluid, skin blusters and tonsillar tissue will have accordingly higher concentrations compared to your serum concentrations. One of the papers say that it has got decent sensitivity to streptococci, be it penicillin susceptible, be it penicillin intermediate or be it penicillin resistant bugs. It has got balanced activity against gram positive, especially the bugs of your interest, gram negative. And when I look at a couple of commonly used antibiotics in our respiratory practice, be it levofloxacin, be it azithromycin or clarithromycin, be it ceftriaxone, cefotexib, injectable, or be it various other molecules of the same group, that is third generation, your uh, cefexime, your cefprodoxime, even second generation like uh, cefiroxime. And when you look at various bugs, the MICs are least when it comes to septitorin. So you have uh, penicillin resistance, streptococcus pneumonia is the first column. You have uh, H influenza, which is beta lactamase positive. You have M catalyst, again beta lactamase positive. You have S pyrogen. You have uh, methylazine sensitive staph, and you have Klebsiella. All these bugs have got fairly decent lowest MIC when it comes to septitorin. It concentrations remain above MIC for a longer duration beyond their half life. And what is interesting is it is stable to hydrolysis by variety of beta lactamases and it is active against all six PBPs and 17 ESBLs. 
mean, means you don't have to add ESBL inhibitor to it. So this particular molecule itself is uh, stable against variety of beta lactamases. And the interesting levels or the bacterial uh, activity is achieved in just less than four hours. We have in our country its approval for acute bacterial exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, sinusitis, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, community acquired pneumonia, and uncomplicated skin and skin structure infection. The dosage is about 200 milligrams twice daily, seven days to 14 days, depending on the clinical indication. And uh, if patient has got severe infection or a patient has got immunocompromised status, you could even use double the dose that is 400 milligrams twice daily. In children, it is available as a, a syrup. You could use 3 milligram per kilogram per dose. You could give up to 3 times a day. We've got decent evidences and there are studies where septitorin was used against levofloxacin, against cefuroxime, against clarithromycin. Again, there's a pooled data of 7 various clinical trials talking about its safety, its efficacy, its, uh, its, its usefulness as a switch uh, therapy from injectable to oral. And... These studies make me conclude that it is one of the most active oral cephalosporin against chipped pneumonia, including resistant strains, H influenza with different resistant phenotypes. Clinical trials show good efficacy of sebgitorin, short cost therapy in acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. It is ideal for switchover therapy, fairly decent safety profile, favorable pharmacoeconomic analysis, and we've got decent post marketing service. And, uh, we took up a small study. Uh, this was done, I think, in 2018, yeah, 2018, 2018, 2019. And uh, we had about uh, 60, uh, 100 and, 116, yes, 116 patients were included, average of age of 63. We had more male patients than female patients. We had smokers, we had non smokers, average weight of what, 77. Majority of them had moderate exacerbations. They had variety of comorbidities. In fact, one patient was a patient of liver transplant. Uh, he was a liver transplant recipient and was on uh, uh, immunosuppressive therapy as well. Majority of my patients were having diabetes and hypertension. Though we don't look at gold now with ABCD, but when we did study, it was ABCD and majority of our patients were into B and C category. Sputum did grow. Streptococci as the commonest bug, though majority of the patient, you can see blue, we did not grow any bug, but streptococci was major bug uh, grown and we have clip shell also, we had H influenza also. Sebditorin was used as 200 milligrams twice daily in majority of the patient, about 100 patients and about 14 patients we used double dose that is 400 milligrams twice daily and clinical success rate was seen in about 108 patients. There were 8 patients who failed this therapy and required hospitalization to switch over to injectable therapy. And the mean CAT score was better in about 4.5 days. 40 patients were followed up for next three months to look at their exacerbation and 26 of them did not have any exacerbation. Fairly safe antibiotic and this was probably, this is what we were trying to look at, whether we can give improvement earlier. A lot of your antibiotics, when we use it for 5 days, 10 days, at the end of 10 days, patient may feel better. But it is on day 2, day 3, day 4, if you can make them feel better. That is earlier recovery. And next point was time to next recovery. Of course, it's a very small study, only 100 patients, only probably two centers data, two centers data, only two centers data. And uh, I, I would love to probably see it more. And if you all have different kind of experience, if you all have used it, it would be very interesting to understand that. With that, uh, I would conclude my presentation by my very favorite two, two slides. And uh, Krishna, success. What does success mean? I was, I'm trying to conclude my presentation by this slide that success means different things at different age. So Zafar Bhai, at the age of three, success would mean not shitting in your pants. Okay. At the age of 12, Arindam, success would mean having friends. At the age of 18, success would mean having driving license. Age of 20, success would mean having sex, though I was but then still a lot of them. At age 35, success would mean having a lot of money. Then take, life takes a you know U-turn and then you come at age 50, where you still have to have a lot of money because by then somebody 
announces demonetization and you lose all your money or you put your money in share market and you lose them by then by the age 60 again success means having ability to do sex at 70 again success means ability to drive car at 75 success again means having your friend because you would lost both of them by that acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis where you could not use the right antibiotic at the right time and at age 80 success would again mean not shitting in your pants and this is how life takes you circle and if we don't use our antibiotics properly if we don't choose our weapons at the right time for the right cases we are going to follow the same life circle as 2000 bc we started with treatment of any disease as here eat this root and that was the only treatment available thousand years later we got wiser and we said root is heathen say this prayer and you will be fine we realize 800 years down the line that prayer is all superstitious came the jamana of those potions have liquids drink potion is a snake oil swallow this pill was the pill culture by 1920 25 years down the line and we realized ah we've got the weapon penicillin and the papers say that that chapters on infection can be closed as you have a super antibiotic which would take care of all possible infections with gram positive with gram negative and then just 10 years and we realized oh bugs have mutated you would need another drug came tetracycline then we had a golden era and we had oops after oops oops after oops we realized mutation is taking place and we need more and more more and more powerful antibiotic and here we stand 2000 AD bugs have won and we may have to go back to eat this route again where we would be left with no choice and I'm sure at the end of this with some brainstorming we would come to a common conclusion and we would use antibiotics rationally thank you very much for your patient hearing If there are any questions, if there are any difference of opinions, I would love to so, address that. It's a pleasure listening to you. And I'm Thank sure uh, Father Saab would be smiling at you from the heavens. I hope, I pray for the uh, peace and the solace for him. So this molecule, just a comment. It's actually no question. I'm sure most of us in this part of the country are not actually experienced with this molecule at all. Now, this is something new that uh, we have actually learned. And I thank you for that. And I, I'll, I'll invite some experiences or, you know, comments from my fellow pulmonologists and critical care intensivists here. If any of them have utilized, starting with you, Dr. Dhirish. So, uh, it looks to be a very attractive option for acute exacerbation of COPD, no doubt. As you have told that it has a good bronchial mucosal concentration and it's uh, resist and it's uh, it can it's resistant to beta lactamases, which is a main issue, and is, the coverage is good. Morexella, Haemophilus, and Streptococcus. It's no doubt it's a good option. I have not tried this molecule, but uh, definitely just to emphasize that uh, we need to pick up those patients quite early, which uh, have bacteria as the cause of exacerbation, correct, correct. and hence we have to treat this uh, patient with rational use of this antibiotic. So the advantage to some extent is not uh, many companies have been marketing this molecule. I think one you only have or any other company. I think very few companies uh, have this particular molecule. And uh, especially the pediatric preparation require very stringent manufacturing as I understand. And probably that's the reason. Uh, to our fortune, to our good luck, probably since this molecule is not very well marketed, I would say, it is less used. It is less misused and if we can probably use it for the right kind of patient as and the whole idea was looking at it from two different uh, points and that is time to clinical recovery and time to next exacerbation those, those were the thought processes behind and we've had i think uh, seven or eight uh, eight meetings we've had on this about uh, and every time we've had a small group of about 15 20 doctors and uh, everybody is enrolled their patient but because of this unprecedented times we could not collect their data but the data seems very interesting. So we have been using as of now only for acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. We don't want to probably recommend its use, though 
we have a DCGA permission for the pneumonia, etc. We have restricted its use for ACB exacerbation. I'm sure if you get chance to use it, I would love to have your inputs on that. Definitely, we need to generate the data for its use yes. in this particular indication. Yes. And there's just my small data with all my biases to it. So then probably a better data, better understanding would make picture a little better. So the topic is open for discussion and in comment here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, you will ask me only simple questions. I'm warning you right in the beginning. Good evening. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk, Dr. Ragam. Uh, just a question uh, in the sense that this is a, uh, a third generation cephalosporin. Sir. So cephaloxime is a second generation second. and still doing good. Most of Sir. our patients still respond. So, and this is still a larger spectrum where you still have some, uh, you know, gram, gram negative vector. Yes, I only by a point. And most of our uh, patients with acute exacerbation of COPD do have gram positive. predominantly gram positive. Correct, sir. So, uh, we still prefer cephaloxime. Perfect. And so, uh, should we consider or when should we consider using cephalodurin as the uh, um, or when should we probably use this molecule so that we don't end up losing this molecule either. so that's a that's a very valid uh, point and uh, i'm sure you will agree with me sir i'm talking about by and large group c patients patients who've got mild to moderate exacerbations and who are mainly into that c category uh, where they get frequent exacerbations so all those patients who've had recent exposure to antibiotics there is a possibility of them having a lot of esbls and in my limited understanding so when you use cephalosporin there, it doesn't work. The molecule is very good, but then all these bugs are ESBL secretors and then it loses its charm. So whenever I have patients who have multiple exacerbations and patients, uh, sir, I'll tell you, typically I started using it for patients who were just short of admissions and I, I thought if I can prevent hospitalization. So in those categories I started and sir, once you have a good response, you want to extrapolate that to relatively milder patients. So, and in Bombay, uh, or I'm sure in Chandigarh also, a lot of these uh, drugs are prescribed by variety of uh, level doctors. So you would see a lot of your uh, patients already consuming cefuroxam before they come to you. And as sir rightly said, since this molecule is not very well marketed or not very badly exposed to variety of other specialists, it is still probably showing good effect, at least in Mumbai where I practice. So that's my small comment to that but then i would love to hear your views on it what do you feel where would you use it would you would you think you would use it for all moderate exacerbation where where you think otherwise they may end up in hospital and then if possible i would probably use it more often uh, in a patient who has some amount of underlying properties where the chances are absolutely negative interesting that's a lovely point and so what do you feel would be the incidence of bronchiectasis in COPD patients where we don't do CT scan routinely for COPD patients? So yeah, absolutely. These situations, when the coming back to us, it can get or increased with prevalent secretions. They may have, correct. Those are the patients that would probably... Absolutely. Not with a sort of complicated. Correct. That's where probably I think this point is. So probably what I understand from Sir's point is any patient who gets frequent exacerbation, frequent mucoprevalence, their need for antibiotics are higher. They may have associated bronchiectasis there. You may suspect more of gram-negative infection there and then yes. And off late, there are, uh, uh, I don't know whether you do it here often. I have a the urine antigen kit in my clinic. So then you have a streptococci and legionella spot urine test available. Cost some 700 rupees, you know, sir. So it's like you do urine pregnancy test for quick diagnosis, you have urine, legionella and streptococca test. So what you do is you, you give your patient that kit and in next 15 minutes you have those two answers ready. So at least you can narrow down your choice of antibiotics based on that. So I mean, that's interesting. Yes, Amutabai. Sir, in my experience of, I am having more than 75,000 documented evidence of COPD with the infected exacerbation. <laughs> That's my 10 lifetimes number. Yes, sir. In that, I have seen that cephalosporin, whatever you said, I have used only 5% of my cases. Other 95%, I have, as sir said, it is okay. But the morbidity, what I am seeing and the mortality, the difference is not because of the infected exacerbation, because we are having a very good adequate knowledge of uh, uh, treating the patient from secondary to tertiary care. Correct. Now, the thing is only because of the right ventricular 
hypertrophy and as well as the pulmonary hypertension associated comorbidities yes that's why uh, whatever we see the copd i request our respirologist that is pulmonologist let them go for seeing the tapsy or just see the volume overload by seeing the pedal edema just putting a lasilactone or a lasix drip by when the patients are in patients the thing is very much reduced sir that's what our observation yes yes i get your point so what you are trying to tell us is the management of associated comorbidities that is extremely the important the main point is pulmonary hypertension and sir. a clinician like you can only probably emphasize more we are in tertiary care we are used to all investigation what you are saying is like art of bedside clinical monitoring that's very important point what we were discussing amutaba is uh, infective exacerbations and 75% of those infective exacerbation if bacterial if bacterial what choices but then i buy your point yes just to add to the point by dr mandal i think because as you said that this is uh, this is active against esbl also yes so the patients who are frequent exacerbators and already hospitalized and taken multiple courses i think that drug can be preferentially given to those patients vis a vis cefuroxime and uh, you know dr agarwal i was looking at uh, the side effect profile and you would be happy or you would be probably you know find it interesting to know that amoxicillin clavulanic acid the loose motions is more because of uh, clavulanic acid actually than because of uh, you know amoxicillin and when you give this uh, esbl esbl have their own set of side effects esbl dose has always been confusing you know what is the right dose of uh, clavulanic acid you have clavulanic acid available as 62.5 mg 37.5 mg and your 125 mg as well suppose if agamora requires amoxicillin krishna my dose will be somewhere around 50 mg per kg so 100 kg would require 5 grams of amoxicillin would mean probably your do combination that you use five tablets a day if five tablets a day of amoxicillin i take 125 mg into five i would end up getting about 700 mg of clavulanic acid which is not required the upper limit of clavulanic acid is 250 mg you know now this is very difficult we don't get this combinations in 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 market and the common uh, uh, combinations with clavulanic acid that you may be prescribing may have very high doses of uh, clavulanic acid would you make any comment on that sir right thank you sir sir i have some online questions as well so this is a question from dr parvat kumar sahu from odisha bhuvaneshwar he says what are the three important or most common co- most common bugs you actually encounter in your practice and he's emphasized actual for some reason wah bhai wah odisha brings me memory of konark temple and jagannath puri temple and i was to be at odisha four days ago there was a epicon odisha which was organized uh, thank you for that question and the common bug that i see in my practice common as if you really ask me is no bugs because most of this patient would end up receiving uh, some of the other antibiotics most of this patients end up if at all getting only sputum cultures done and if i have a habit of asking for rt pcrs that is multiplex pcrs we may be able to pick up more <laughs> bugs politically <laughs> truth not yet you know why is it of yet to interpret those levels well in the sense you have multiplex pcr showing variety of bugs i don't know how relevant those bugs are in that clinical scenario extension of that point would be there is no need trust me there is no need for asking for cultures in every copd exacerbation it is fruitless all you have to do is ask for cultures only in high risk patients patients who require hospitalization must be thoroughly investigated but any patients who are being managed on opd basis i quote do not require cultures to be sent on a routine basis having said that if i am picking up bug yes streptococca is still the commonest bug thank you sir another question is from dr thila gavati guru murthy from tamil nadu chennai tamil nadu is asking is it effective against all pseudomonas special query pseudomonas mirabilis not really not really and i i don't know about the pseudomonas terabelli mirabelli that you said i'm sorry i'll have to check up uh, or they may be no Next so pseudomonas question. that particular variant you said no and anyway pseudomonas uh, would require specific anti pseudomonal antibiotics and i would i would urge you if you have picked up pseudomonas please manage them in hospital please manage them as indoor patients and please give them long term antibiotics please repeat that cultures and continue antibiotics till pseudomonas uh, you know probably does not grow anymore thank you 
क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम डॉक्टर त्रिदीप चैटर्जी फ्रॉम महाराष्ट्र मुंबई डॉक्टर चैटर्जी मुंबई ही इज आस्किंग एक्सपीरियंस अगेंस्ट एसी एक्सपीरियंस विद सेपिडोटोरन विद एसिनिटोबैक्टर एंड एमआरएस एसिनिटोबैक्टर एंड सेपिडोटोरन अगेन एसिनिटोबैक्टर एटसेट्रा आर serious bugs and most of these bugs would require hospitalization this you will hardly see these bugs giving you very mild disease and if you get really this bug with mild disease you can you can be for sure that these are not the bug responsible and that's that's probably error somewhere in picking up those bugs if they are real asinetobacter i would suggest them to be hospitalized and give them injectable antibiotics would not recommend to use sep thank you sir moving on further i think other questions you mostly covered in your talk so i'll not be taking them up thank you uh, dr tapan sarkar from west bengal kolkata he writes a dr agam prolific speaker a visual storyteller we are mesmerized and thanks Ish. this is your first all your love. appearance after your father's passing away thank you sir thank you so thank much you, sir It... may i now invite uh, dr krishna sir to please come forward to felicitate our speaker ah. dr agam it's so nice to get felicitated by family member by a friend May I now invite Dr. Amutha Sir and Dr. Agam to please come forward to felicitate our chairpersons for the session, Professor Deepak Agarwal. Dr. Krishna, please come forward, please. thank you sir may i please request dr krishna dr amutha and dr agam vora to please felicitate dr zafar a chairperson for the session thank you sir we will continue with the scientific agenda and it is my utmost pleasure to first of all invite chair persons for this session my teacher and mentor dr ak mandal sir consultant from fortis mohali may i also invite dr deepak basin consultant pulmonologist from max mohali to chair this session thank you sir for being here with us today now we come to the second talk for the day and we have with us dr arindam kar he is the head critical care at sri at, at sir h n reliance foundation hospital mumbai and is the national um, is the national secretary journal for indian society of critical care for 2020 to 2022 and sir has various accolades to his credit if i start listing them i think uh, we'll be halfway through the session so sir i can only uh, express my heartfelt gratitude that you are here with us today sir please come forward for your talk sir will be taking a talk on ards thank you sir for being here with us today
I think I'm standing between the, all the social gathering and I came to know this is the first time CCI is meeting in a hybrid format and uh, I think a sumptuous uh, dinner and everything is <laughs> awaited. Anyway, so uh, first of all, before I begin, I uh, uh, just uh, wanted to know that uh, uh, are most of you practicing also for keeping your patients or treating your patients in ICU? Most of you. So it would be, yeah, Monal, sir, I know it. So about you, it's, yep. So, so that would be, so then accordingly, I will make my talk in that way. Okay. And uh, I'm working in uh, Reliance Foundation, which is a, a comparatively newer hospital, but quite well advanced. And we do a lot of uh, uh, general basic stuff, but also we are doing one of the most uh, advanced and aggressive in, in organ transplantation. And we are doing all sorts of lung, uh, cardiac, uh, gut transplant, liver transplant. And we are also going forward towards all other different types of uh, organ transplant itself, including uh, what we call a donation after circulatory death, which we are contemplating. Chandigarh has done the first, I think, the PGI, a donation after circulatory death, and we are going towards that part. And in my area of interest, I do uh, have started working on uh, the digital health, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, into AI and, and sort of machine learning, big data and all others. So maybe in in future, if I'm invited again in, in some way or other, we can talk about that part. So today it was mostly on ARDS itself, uh, therapeutic options in ARDS itself. And disclaimer, I'm not as good as uh, Dr. Ragambhora, but I would try to make it interesting to that extent because I have a uh, little bit of experience of more than two decades in in different parts of the country itself and different parts of the globe. I've worked in many different countries. So I've gathered uh, experience to that extent. And uh, I'm, I'm a quite, I can say that an opportunist end user, right? So I can uh, take uh, good things from others and use it in that way. So this is what we can say that the uh, the etiology of ARDH itself, so primarily infection, uh, which was predominantly bacterial, but uh, due to the COVID, we have had so many patients of viral ARDS itself. So now we can, the virus, uh, the chunk has also gone into, but there are also non-infective causes, particularly like your pancreatitis, trauma, uh, blood transfusion, but we, we call call it trally itself. So these are also there. And uh, initially, the first, uh, the definition of ARDS came way back in 1967 by Ashbach, but it was almost rejected by five or six different journals, right? So, and, and eventually got published because no one was interested to come up with that, what these guys are coming up with a new concept. It was rejected, but anyway, it started with that. But uh, after many evolutions uh, in 2014, I was there in Berlin when the, they came up with the ESICM Congress, the, the more definitive diagnosis of uh, uh, the, the diagnostic criteria for ARDS, which we all know now is called the Berlin definition, which has included the timing, the the modality of imaging that you should know where is the origin of pulmonary edema, but also they tried to find out that uh, the, 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 the severity of the uh, the oxygenation uh, that is hampered as well as whether this severity is associated with the mortality also. So that's how they have sort of given a much more objectified and prognosticated uh, definition of ARDS itself. So that's what we call a Berlin definition. So what had happened in that, then in ARDS initially we we actually, we didn't know in 80s and 90s, we were completely ignorant of the, the bad effects of ventilation itself. So we were actually doing more harm than good. 
and uh, uh, Dr. Amit and Dr. Singh will agree with us that we had a uh, not that fair idea of ventilation and ventilation idea was mostly percolating from our colleagues of anesthesia and we were trying to make everything correct in that part and we were actually uh, the mortality was higher on ventilation and that concept actually went to the society and it is still uh, reverberating that concept that once into ventilator it, it, the patient doesn't come back on that part but after that uh, the landmark trial have come to that when we understood that we have to be gentle with the lung and we have to accept certain shortcomings that uh, in, in this disease process, when the lung is affected, you cannot normalize that entire uh, biochemical profile itself. So when we understood that and when we started accepting certain shortcomings, the, the, the mortality improved. The, the, a lot of things improved 2000 onwards. And then uh, with the advent of uh, the different, uh, what we say, uh, the diagnostic markers, the the uh, experimental lab i have worked with arthur slatsky in in canada where they do what we call uh video uh, sort of alveolar video microscopy so they, they put a nano video uh, parts within the alveoli itself to note that how uh, uh, faulty ventilation techniques can actually hamper the alveoli itself. So it, this, those are the actual pictures of alveoli being captured over a, on a videography itself. So nano videography and all others. Now even you have got what we call lung on the chip. I think Agam sir knows that, that you can you can find out that what exactly uh, the medications or the ventilation is doing harm on the lung itself. So that, that's the model they, they have called the lung on the chip. So everything was going better. We achieved a lot better meant in our uh, outcome from ventilation than COVID struck. Right. And in the first wave, still we did good. Right. But in the second wave, we I think we did miserably and in that way. So despite all our knowledge, despite all the resources, preparedness, even in the developed countries, maybe there could be some resource related issues and all others. But still, I think uh, we, we uh, the mortality was way higher than what our knowledge has given uh, that advantage in last two decades. So the ARDS, it's pretty, if you see that how to go ahead with a patient of ARDS, the, there are two divisions that you need to take care of. One is to recognize the syndrome that whether you are actually dealing with ARDS, not certain ARDS mimics, right, particularly the cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema or any other interstitial disease exacerbation and others. And then also to identify the cause of the syndrome because unless and until you revert that particular inciting uh, factor that has initiated the ARDS process, it is going to be an difficult to deal with the ARDS. And the ventilatory strategy is just to buy time and keep the patient alive and to revert the overall process. So before uh, on that part, you need to understand that this is what we most of us know that this is the fallout of the faulty ventilation that we were doing. We were inflating with higher volumes or higher pressures and we were creating more problems that we call volute trauma or barot trauma, mostly pneumothoraxes, pneumomediastinams and all others. But also we were uh, not preventing that opened up alveoli to collapse we were not preventing that collapse so it was repeated opening and collapsing so that we have termed as atelectroma it's almost the analogy that if you open the door and close almost thousand times a day definitely the hinge or the door is going to be damaged on that part so similarly the alveoli is also going to damage with if with each respiration you are going to open and close on that part so that is an atelectroma but most importantly what was happening is that we found when we 
very less about ventilation that in the first 48 72 hours the patient was doing good everything improved but then uh, multi organ dysfunction started to set in right the patient died because of aki and others so late 90s sir when we all started doing and we were helpless that what is what exactly was happening and we had no idea about the cytokines or inflammatory storms and all others so our understanding of pathophysiology was also limited so again this group particularly Laurent Brochard from Switzerland and the Canadian group, the Brazilian group, Amato, everyone came up with this, the ideas that actually the injured alveoli, the injury due to the primary process or due to the ventilation, faulty ventilation process is actually releasing a lot of inflammatory cytokines, which is causing the injury to the distant organs and causing the multi-organ dysfunction. So you have to gentle with the lungs to limit the release of all those inflammatory cytokines and then only you can. So now you can seldom see that uh, at least the, the incidence has come down. We have understood the ideas better that there are different degrees of severity and different stages, different etiologies. And uh, we have to individualize treatment. I will come to that. What is well, what we call now the precision ventilation therapy, just like we are doing in oncology, right? Every individual patient, according to the, the marker, according to the tumor marker, or according to the genetic uh, makeup of the tumor itself, we are individualizing a precision oncology. We are actually thinking of looking into a precision ventilation sort of thing. The aim is to protect the lung from further injury from ventilation to buy time at times even the bypass the lung itself in in form of ecmo right so if your injury is that severe so whatever the CV, uh, the the lung has been affected by the primary process let's not do more harm so that's the basic principle of our medical ethics right the first principle primum non nocere first do no harm so that that is an 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 in in any and the key is to reduce a hyperinflation and keep the lung open. And you have to understand that the same therapies which may be useful in certain patients can be detrimental in, in, the, in the different patients or maybe in a different stage of the, uh, of the, of the same patient itself. The other concept Lucio Gattinoni came is that, that what we call the baby, baby lung concept, right? Where the, the, this is, uh, the analogy is like a, that whatever lung, a healthy lung is remaining is almost the size of a lung of a baby itself. So you have to do whatever you have to do, you have to do with that. Day. So if you put a 10 ml per kg, of tidal volume in this uh, uh, on a on a lung of a baby itself it will definitely hyperinflate so you, whatever you have left is you have to work with and that is almost a, a lung size of a baby itself and this is what we call the spectrum of regional opening pressure so if you see this intermediate area this is the, the zone of higher risk where there is a lot of small airway collapse and the alveolar collapse and reabsorption and this atelectroma can happen and and the, this is the upper area is of the hyperinflation can also happen but this is the most area of a and this picture is important because this would be also applicable when you apply the concept of what we do the proning itself right but the, when we sort of prone the patient itself and lastly the concept that we should also understand the concept of high inspired oxygen so uh, the covid has taught us that the oxygen is a very precious uh, medicine right so we have to use it very judiciously in fact the concept and the terminology of oxygen stewardship has also come that you have to use very very cautiously and with that almost i think fifth wave is looming right everyone have, we, are, we are getting i think i have received at least 20 whatsapp messages in last one hour that this is xbb variant and all others people are getting little tensed on that uh, a lot of uh warnings have been started some obviously some panics and all others but anyway 
not getting into that let's enjoy whatever the time do we do have if if, if you are not getting into the any other uh, waves and all others so oxygen is actually detrimental so right from your reabsorption atelectasis to all others but most importantly the oxygen free radicals or reactive oxygen species that can that oxygen can develop is is uh, again can cause a lot of biotrauma itself so you have to accept if it is a diseased lung you accept 90 to 92% of saturation or 55 or to 60 of po2 itself right you do not have to uh, actually uh, make that entire it at the normal c or entire full correction in fact there is a concept of that if your very bad lung patient ARDS patient on ventilator if your pco2 po2 are completely correct or normalized then you are overdoing it right so we have to sir do you agree on that part so we 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 have to accept and certain so what the dictum i teach my students is that the give the lowest possible fio2 which gives you the best possible spo2 at according to that situation or according to that x-ray itself right so and always come down to the 60, uh, 60 and below at the earliest possible opportunity so that's that's an name so ventilator strategy we have kept as is we call the keep it simple and silly the kiss strategy to give smaller volumes four to six ml per kg of ideal body weight the fallout would be to maintain the minute volume you have to give a higher respiratory rate so even in certain circumstances with that higher respiratory rate you may not be uh, you may not achieve a normal pco2 right the pco2 can go up and the ph can go down you accept that that we call a permissive hypercapnia you accept ph at to the till the level of 7.25 even 7.15 unless it is causing a lot of uh, hemodynamic altercations and others you limit the plateau pressures right these are all available in the ventilators or now you have all the other pressures like transpulmonary pressures driving pressures and all others so the basic idea is don't don't hyper inflate and keep within the limits that are being given right and then you can look into others so the clinical goals are that maintain the saturation in and around 86 to 92 right covid has taught us that even with 60s and 70s with four weeks to almost months patient has still gone home without any hypoxic damage right and and we have we all have had send our patients like that so so hypoxia, if not accompanied by cardiac arrest or very low hypo, uh, low perfusion, is not going to damage your brain cells. We have enough of uh, compensatory physiological mechanisms to extract oxygen to maintain our ray. So 86 to 92 percent is very acceptable. PO2 around 55 to still you can go up to almost 100. Right, it's called the concept called supercapnia itself. You uh, uh, you accept uh, a hypercapnia that was trying to say, and again, if you have normal everything, then you are overdoing it. Right. So this was the uh, landmark trial done by almost uh, all the people from Europe, Latin America, North America, everywhere, all contributed, and this was the first trial which showed a positive outcome in ARDS ventilation and they just gave this idea that keep your tidal volume much less and before that we were giving almost 8 to 12 ml per kg and this was an extrapolation of the anesthesia concept where you hyper inflate the lung itself you see any anesthesiologist in the older days they were almost squeezing the two liter bag to the fullest and the lung were went uh, hyperventilated and others so that was the extrapolation we were ventilating on on a higher tidal volume here you gently do that and they came up with brilliant results almost a 20 percent absolute risk reduction in the mortality and all others so everyone was gung-ho everyone accepted and and also and an, 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 an. the other concept which actually came up is to recruit the lungs if it can be recruited so you open up the collapsed alveoli if they're not permanently closed so i'm not going into details there are a lot of recruitment maneuvers even controversies on that but I still believe, I think, I mean, uh, we'll also believe on the recruitment to some extent, right? The other concept is the PIP. The, there was also a lot of 
controversy is whether to keep lower PIP or a higher PIP. I will come to that on a uh, sort of that uh, what is a, uh, uh, what is what we call now is called an optimal PIP. But what is beyond controversy now, which is the second thing which has proven mortality benefit is proning of the patient itself, right? And it is quite physiological. All of us, we all take curvatase almost, uh, what is in no normal around 50 to 60 times in an average nighttime sleep. We all take uh, our turns to be full prone, lateral prone, partial prone and everything. And that is what the nature has given us to improve physiologically our oxygenation and others. So it's a complete physiological process the only thing is that uh, nowadays COVID has taught us many things. Every hospital has now a prone team, right? So all, all the big uh, male nursing guys or the young registrars, they, they lead the proning team. And most of the people have now learned to avoid any sort of complications. Initially, a lot of complications were happening during proning, cardiac arrest, arrhythmias, dislodgement of the tubes and all others. But I think now this is more or less an acceptable practice and and <coughs> complications are not, not happening on that part. So this was actually started with the, the Italian peoples. Right, thank you, I will have. Thank you. So the, I, the mostly the, the guys from the, the Italians are very good on, on A. So all, most of this concept has come from the Canadians or the Italians particularly because many of the Italians ICUs uh, have bedside CTs. So they, they can look into the, that what is happening on, with their interventions itself. And these bedside CTs have been there for almost mid, from mid 80s itself. Gattinoni has uh, bedside city from 1979, something of that sort. So this is how they have done. So they always work on that. So be it your steroid, use of steroid in the ARDS, proning, your baby lung concept, all has come from the Italian critical care uh, practitioners. So this is also proning when none was doing, Italians were doing it for years. And when this Proceva trial came and it showed a huge impact. And when we also started doing it and we saw that this is happening, this, it's instantly the, uh, the hypoxia is getting corrected. We started adopting it. And I would request you guys to look into this very nice explanation that how uh, you can predict that how which patient would do better on, on, on proning and in different, different uh, ARDS, whether it's a pulmonary ARDS or extra pulmonary ARDS, how uh, proning can improve and how you can even predict even before proning the patient itself. Non-invasive ventilation, we have tried, particularly again, COVID has, uh, because of the scarcity of the ventilator, because people didn't want to get ventilated, the relatives didn't give consent and all others, we have stretched is far beyond what the NIV can accomplish, right? So what we have done is that two things had happened. We have initially the... The recommendation is that it should be used in the initial period in the milder form of VRDS, but we have stretched it. But what we have also found that a lot of higher incidences of, uh, I think, barotrauma was, was common with uh, the NIV, use of NIV itself. And also, uh, there were a little bit of faulty use because there is a basic difference if you are practicing or putting NIVs on on, on uh, sort of serious patients you need to there are difference within the mask and the vent itself if you are using an home NIV or a portable NIV or NIV through your ventilator itself so please be careful on that part so that's that's the difference and also we have used HFNC and you have used combination of HFNC and NIV itself, right? So where HFNC was giving higher FiO2, the highest possible FiO2, and NIV was giving the inspiratory pressure to offload the respiratory muscles itself. So this is also a very nice picture, which is you're depicting the sequential respiratory support. You start with HFNC and then you move on to NIV, maybe a combination of HFNC and NIV. And if it is not sufficing, you go on for a invasive ventilation. Even if it is not, then you can go for the ECMO itself. And the, the, the predicting factor is the work of breathing, not 
your FIO2 itself. So if your patient's work of breathing is not getting better with HFNC, you go move on to NIV. And uh, if you if it is not, then you have to be on invasive ventilation. And if your patient has got a bad lung, never shy off of ventilating the patient. Right? You have to buy time to save the patient itself. NIV is not going to cure, right? It, it, it's a sort of a... I think, do you want to comment on that, sir, that we have prolonged NIV to that extent? I think with NIV and HFN, the picture, right? Two, pa two patients, uh, yes. Here you can, uh, I think, go with the uh, NIV and in combination with HFNO. But for moderate and severe IRDs, I think it is delaying our intubation and that is doing more harm than uh, any bit benefit out of that. Right? Okay, the, the other ventilation rescue strategies that we have done, which is easy to do, anyone can do it, is one is inverse ratio ventilation, nothing else that you are giving more time in the inspiration than in the expiration. In a COPD, what we do, we give more time for the expiration because there is expiratory flow limitation, but in type 1 uh, respiratory failure, hypoxemic failure, uh, where you want to give uh, more oxygenation, you increase the absolute inspiratory time. Two things happen. One is with a higher inspiratory time, the alveoli with a longer time constant, they get time to open up. The mean airway pressure goes up. So that improve your oxygenation. And also with a reduced expiratory time, there is an what we call an intrinsic PIP. And that PIP is added with whatever PIP you are adding. And that keeps your alveoli opened up alveoli opened itself right so it is uh, you are adding up to your peep itself so inverse ratio ventilation just practice it very simple any ventilator you just have to change your ie ratio and you have to you can limit your plateau pressures and everything on that part the other one a little fancy what we call airway pressure release ventilation this is available in certain ventilator itself this is nothing but what we are doing is that we are ventilating at a higher pressure. So your baseline pressure, rather than being on to 0 to 5 or something of that sort, it is around 30 to 40. And what we do is that rather than inspiration and expiration, there are releases. So that's why it's called airway pressure release. So when you want to vent out, the pressure comes down. So airway release that happens. So TI and TE, something of that sort happens. So it's a, a little bit of conceptually uh, different but you just uh, try to understand that your lung is filled up with air and it, the pressure is on the higher side and now you are trying to breathe in and breathe out with that higher so so baseline there are a lot of the frc is much higher the pressure is much higher so in that cases most of the time we need to sedate heavily or even paralyze those patients right and in and and in a but it works well and it is much better than what we have used before in high frequency it's much better than the high frequency and uh, lastly uh, the extra corporeal therapies that we have done Right. This is the first one, what we call the extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal. So this is applicable where you are giving what we call ultra low tidal volume. That means the lung is absolutely bad. Even 4 to 6 ml per kg of tidal volume is going to be detrimental. We are going below 4 ml per kg. So what will happen? The PCO2 will rise very dangerously. So you have to take care of the PCO2. You cannot give bicarbonate because bicarbonate eventually will be converted into the carbon dioxide itself and it will add up to the work of breathing itself. So the only way out is to re uh, to remove the carbon dioxide when an extracorporeal circuit itself from the blood itself. So that's what we have done in ECOR itself. So this was the first generation of the extracorporeal what we call pumpless uh, lung assist a pumpless extracorporeal lung assist. I took this training in, in Munich itself. So this is simple. You just have attached the femoral artery with femoral vein. So the blood is coming out because of you have, you're taking it out from the femoral artery the, according to the patient's blood pressure. And with gravity, it is going back to the, to the femoral vein. And the intervening is, so there is no pump. So pumpless. And the intervening thing is, is, is where the carbon dioxide exchange is taking place. So carbon dioxide is getting out of it. So you would have said that why not oxygen can be put in also. So it all depends on the flow. 
So if you have a lesser flow, as carbon dioxide is 200 times more diffusible than oxygen, it can be taken out. But to it infuse oxygen into it, you need a higher flow. So when you need a higher flow, you need a pump. So in that case, that's how the ECMO concept also came. So nothing, ECOR is a simplified version of ECMO itself. So later on, we added pump to make it more uh, predictable, the exchange more predictable, and also to factor in the patient's hypotensions and others. So the, so the second and third generation, Nova Lung came, right? And but what, the, again, the Italians, and I learned it from them in Sir Turin, and I did the first ECOR in India through the dialysis machine. So what they did is that they inserted within the dialysis machine itself a neonatal membrane oxygenator, and they did, did that part. So you see, this was the, the first patient we did, right? Uh, before that, uh, Dr. Mani did the hemolung itself in I think uh, Delhi or Chandigarh, no Delhi, De Delhi. De he did it in Delhi. The, he brought a machine for a politician from US itself and did the ECOR. But we did this, this was in, in Kolkata itself, within a dialysis machine, we inserted a neonatal membrane oxygenator. So the dialysis flow is around 200, your blood flow 200 to 250. In that 200 to 250, the carbon dioxide is getting exchanged out of it. And in an ECMO, if you see the ECMO, this is an ECMO machine, you need almost two liters per minute flow only to your when you need the oxygen also to be infused, right? And in that, so you need all sort of sophisticated pumps, bigger lines, bigger flows, right? On the complete anticoagulation and everything. So ECOR is a much simplified where you are still being able to ventilate the patient, albeit your uh, the tidal volume is much lesser on that part. And lastly, we all know when there is no way out and your lungs are completely uh, damaged, so you, you can bypass the lung itself and you can pay, put the patient on ECMO itself. ECMO has saved certain lives, particularly in the first wave. Second wave, we have had not so good uh, uh, sort of experience because the lungs, ECMO can buy time for the lungs to recover. But most of the times, the lung didn't recover, right? So we we were sort of, uh, uh, the initial part, our idea was put an ECMO. The ECMO will act as a what we call bridge to recovery. The lung will recover, right? And then we progress to a bridge to nowhere. So we have put the patient on ECMO and neither the patient is recovering nor we are getting a lung transplantation. And also by the time we are getting a, a, a transplantation, transplantable lung the patient is quite sick it's almost now 70 to 90 days entire india is looking for lungs and all others there were no traumas no brain deaths where would we get lungs right so there was and it was such a difficult situation right people had to wait average for 70 to 90 days to get lungs and by that time their health was with multiple infections and all others it was very difficult but the good part is that uh, what we learned from the uh, uh, different lung transplantation and others that we were always worried about that this patient is septic, how a transplantation will happen. So what, what happens is that the majority of the infection arises from the lung itself and you are transplanting that, you are removing that. So a big chunk of your source of infection is removed with the lung transplantation and, and most of your lung transplantation patients are actually completely on multiple your ILD patients, multiple admissions, multiple infections, or cystic fibrosis patients. So they would be infected. There is no, it would be an utopian concept to get a, a probable transplant recipient without any infection itself, right? So we have to, and with all the good antibiotics, we can manage that part, right? So this is the concept of ventilation concept. And a lot of newer concepts are also coming, what we call the mechanical power, right, then the transpulmonary pressure, uh, making it uh, sort of uh, precision made, and I will come to that. But more importantly, that what are the non-ventilator strategies that can affect the outcome and which is easier also to do, right? So first of all, that how we can prevent ARDS to happen. 
if you minimize your transfusion, if you give less fluids, if you are gentle with your ventilation strategies for uh, any elective patients, if you do a good monitoring and reduce the fluids, if you uh, recognize that the NIV failure is happening, all this can prevent a uh, potential ARDS to happen. So this is a very important part that you can prevent ARDS insert. We have to be very, very careful on the fluids, right? Less is more is the strategy for ICU itself. So we have now the rose concept of fluid. I think uh, Dr. Mandal and Supradeep goes, you guys do a lot of work on fluid therapies and all others, right? The rose is that in the initial resuscitation phase, give adequate fluid, but from the next phase onwards, optimization, your stabilization and all others, you reduce your fluids. And in the last stage evacuation, you may add a little bit of diuretic. Right, and keep the patient eventually the cumulative balance should be negative. Early use of neuromuscular blocker in a very bad ARDS. The first Danish trial showed that if you use 48 hours completely sedated and paralyzed, the synchronization of the patient with the ventilation is much better, and you get a lot uh, uh, better outcome on that part. Nitric oxide, as Sir was telling, pulmonary hypertension and RV dysfunction. So nitric oxide we had been using, but in selected, particularly again, transplant, uh, uh, probable transplant recipient and in neonates and in this primary pulmonary hypertension and all others and, and rest of the normal or uh, your uh, general ARDS, it doesn't work that well. Uh, regarding, I'll come to that, steroids, the verdict is still we have debates. But normally, it should not be used before 7 days, not after 14 days. So in that initial phase of fibroproliferation, if you use steroids, right, methylprednisolone 1 milligram per kg, it might work well. And this is the complete list of the use of steroids where it could be, right, community acquired pneumonia, Agam sir will agree with me, Some, sometimes we do use influenza, it possibly increases mortality, so never to be used. Marts and SARS, we are not very clear, but COVID, yes, we have used and we have saved lives with it. So this is a, a little, we don't know, it could be a double-edged sword, but yes, in severe ARDS, when the patient is not improving, seven days is over, you can consider and normally we do use steroid on that part. So this is uh, a very nice slides. So when your patients have a risk factors for lung injury, right? You do an early resuscitation with resopressors. So start your NORAD earlier rather than giving more fluids. So give less fluids, give resopressors so that your lungs are not flooded. And there are chances that maybe in future aspirin, vitamin D can come some positive in the trials and they may be used as anti-inflammatory. When you have an early acute lung injury, right? HFNC uh, rather than using uh, your ventilation is giving showing some benefit in a phase three trials as well as inhaled beta agonist and corticosteroids particularly inhaled beta agonists are actually moving the fluid away from the alveoli itself and improving your name and lastly when your patients is in full-fledged ARDS if you are using any drugs two drugs are showing excellent promise one is neuromuscular uh, blockade and the other one is the vitamin c itself right so I would, I think almost the time is over, but I would come to the last part. If you guys are interested, I'm not getting into the phenotypes and sub phenotypes of ARDS itself. This slide, I would, uh, the, uh, I won't skip. Then I will go to the, the concept of aviptadil, the new kid on the block on that, the pharmacological therapeutic option for ARDS. But before that, if you see, this is the prototype injury scheme. So as I was telling you that no ARDS are the same itself. The first one, see this picture on the A, this is epithelial dominant injury. And this is mostly neutrophil driven injury itself. And this, the prototype is pneumonia itself. See the, the second one, it's called, it's, it's extracellular matrix driven injury. So the, the primary injury site is the extracellular matrix of the alveoli itself. And this is prototype of a ventilator-induced lung injury. The third one, the C, right? This is 
mostly the endothelium dominated injury and this is what the sepsis causing a lung injury because now the inflammatory cytokines are coming through the circulation itself and the last one is mostly the coagulation the thrombogenicity which has been on the hallmark of covid itself so that's when so if you can have so in 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 the one overall the uh, ards pictures you can have so many combination of things or one thing as a predominant so if you know this uh, phenotype right or a genotype itself, right, sir? Think of now you can what we call the slicing and dicing of your ideas. Now you can do your work and you can choose from a lot of different precision therapy. So these are the different anti inflammatory, anti thrombotic, anti substances, multiple things, including germ cells, including mesenchymal stromal cells, uh, stem cell therapy. Multiple things have been used in clinical as well as in preclinical texting. So if you guys are interested, I can share with you. So I don't want to bore you with all these things. But lastly, these are all your lung chip on the uh, side. This is how the gene therapy is also being used for ARDS itself. But what we can use right now, which is available thanks to uh, our industry friend to bring this to India is this what we call the VIP or the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. So we all read VIP in the first year in Ganong, right? The small short notes Atete and all others, right? And we can only relate VIP with carcinoid syndrome, right? So VIP causes carcinoid syndrome, say diarrhea and all others. And that's why you would be thinking how can an intestinal polypeptide work in an ARDS itself, in the lung itself? In fact, the VIP has got the the receptors itself are more predominant in the lung than intestine itself. So it was a little bit of misnomer. And this medicine, as this is a polypeptide, it's a 28 amino acid, just like insulin itself. It's a polypeptide. So it has to be given IV. You cannot give it in an oral format itself. It's a small A. And or the other advantage of being a, using a polypeptide is that normally it should not be uh, very toxic to the body itself because it's it is present in the body itself right so there should not be any very life threatening uh, sort of uh, infection itself uh, 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 complication itself right so this is an injectable formulation right we have 150 mics per 10 ml and this is the chemical structure with a smaller molecular weight and how it works it works through your the NMDA induced caspase 3 activation in the lung, right? It, pre, it preserves the pulmonary tissue, right? It inhibits the alveolar epithelial cells apoptosis. It reduces the inflammatory cytokine productions in the pulmonary systems, both in the epithelial and endothelial matrix itself. But more importantly, right, it promotes the synthesis of the surfactant in cell. It directly acts on the alveolar type two, type 2 alveolar cells to produce more surfactants in that A. So this is how it, 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 it acts, right? So mostly it reduces your inflammation and it improves your protection through increasing the level of surfactant in the lung itself, right? So this is how it works. So it's, it's new kid on the block. It has been extensively used in in certain parts of Europe and uh, US during COVID related ARDS. And now uh, Juventus and put an effort and got this both for COVID and non COVID related ARDS. It is being approved by DCGI. And uh, this is how you have to give it. It is a three day course. In day one, you have to give one vial, in day two, two, and day three, you have to give three, like that. So what actually you are increasing the dose because of certain sort of your allergic reaction. So you have an incremental dose itself. And the other part, little uh, to be remembered, a little funny on that part, that if you have a higher body weight, you have to give it faster. And if you have a lower body weight, you have to give it slower. So this is a little uh, paradox sort of way so that you have incrementing dro incremental dosage and with the higher body weight you have to give it on a uh, faster basis on that part. So a, a lot of trials has been done outside India but in Indian trial 
this was done in eight different centers and they randomized uh, and cutting across from uh, South India to Varanasi to Pune, Mangalore, Kolkata, Eastern India and Patna. So they have, they have randomized 150 people, right? So 76 uh, received aviptadil and they were analyzed in uh, with the, the other group which received placebo, but both the group received standardized care. And what they found the primary outcome was the resolution of respiratory failure, right? As defined by the, uh, the WHO seven point ordinal scale, it was absolutely very, very 2.1 fold odds of getting better of respiratory failure on day, at day three and 2.6 fold at day seven compared to the placebo. So that means there is a double chance of patients getting better after the completion of the primary therapy itself. So quite an interesting, eh? so if you see in day three, so almost 32% of the patients got better on that part. I will show you here. See, that's abiptadil. The mean difference is very high, all statistical significant difference that had been happening. So on day three, the higher and statistical significant proportion of patients on abiptadil, 32 versus 18, shifted to milder clinical scale. On day seven, 68% of the patients shifted to milder clinical scale. And not only that, this advantage has actually also carried forward until day 28. So on this is this is on the day seven. And even on the day 28, which was though a secondary outcome, this advantage was there. So 80% of the patient got better on, on the patient who were on, followed up, who received abitadil and were followed up. Obviously, the, the difference was, the absolute difference was 6% and it was not statistically significant. But this two on the day three and day seven were both statistically significant. And also, not only getting better on the who ordinal scale, but the PF absolute increment in the PF ratio was much higher in the patients who received abiptadil itself. So this is a, a, a drug which we can say, I think Dr. Agam would uh, has used on certain number of patients. We have started using it in Reliance. We have certain issues on, on, on sort of ethical clearance and all others, which are, which are I think, uh, Zuventus can give an idea on that because this is now approved by DCGI. So your hospital ethics committee or, or the others, they can be pretty well convinced with the, the data and all others and it can be used and it is not that costly. We have something to act on. It has worked well on the COVID related ARDS. It should extrapolate. Uh, it should be uh, useful in non-COVID related ARDS because the principle it is same. It is not acting on anything specific, uh, which is specific on uh, COVID itself. And most importantly, the side effects are very, very minimal. Mostly you are a little bit of hypotension, pruritus and, and non-significant diarrhea. These are your basic. Eh? There are no life-threatening com complications or side effects that can happen. So I'm... Uh, Thank you for patient listening and some quicker questions if it is there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arindam. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, exposition of uh, learnings in the RDS, right from basics to the advanced extracorporeal therapies. Uh, also touching upon on the role of HFNC and NIV. Uh, a couple of, I think, uh, though we are pretty late, but I'll I have a couple of questions. So what is the appropriate indication or timing for this drug when, uh, if, if we have to use it in, and what sort of ARDS patient subset should we be uh, choosing uh, to use? The uh, overall, uh, obviously you can pretty well understand, sir, the, the literature is not very vast. It's quite scanty. So the maximal usage that had happened in the, within the first 48 to 72 hours of the detection. And most of them, almost 95% of them has been used in pulmonary related or infective related ARDS. So they have not, uh, in fact, 
uh, the literature has mostly come during the COVID stages because this was what we call an orphan drug. So this was there for other usage, discovered way back in 1960s, not picked up by any of the companies, not marketed very aggressively. It was only used during COVID itself. So most of them had been, the literature has come from COVID itself. So non-pulmonary uh, uh, IDS, uh, as of now, they have not done. Recently, it has started on acute pancreatitis and all others. Some initial reports are pouring in, sir. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the audience? Or I'll questions. take online questions. Sir, I think sir is asking. Sir, it is the latest that I am among the highest ARDS and ARDS. I'm having almost 30 to 40 years ARDS. Most of the ARDS are TB oriented. And in COVID, I have treated more than 135 patients who are 95 to 100 percent involvement with 25 out of 25 or 40 out of 40, sir. Right, sir. Because we are having three, 256 slice CT by Dr. KGS, well known right, sir. radiologist by Southeast Asia. Right, sir. And my opinion, the latest imaging therapy being in ARDS, we don't have such a master brains like you or RMPL or Ahambor or here in the all part of India when 130 uh, crore people are here. So what is your suggestion on G5 ventilators with Intel event and Intel sync ventilators? What is your opinion of G5 ventilators with Intel event and Intel sync mode? So you want me to comment on the, the make of the ventilator no, or sir, something? It is, what is the use of the ventilator? The use of the, the you see ventilator, sir, Intel event, it, uh, the, the analogy of ventilator is like mobile, right? So you can have an iPhone or you can have a 2110 Nokia. But the, the, the purpose is the sir. is the purpose is to get a call or do a make a call, right? So you can save life even with the basics of the ventilator if you know if you have only two modes, one control mode, one pressure support mode. Nothing else is required. Yes, yeah, yeah. to answer that question, I think it is basically helping us uh, select the appropriate peep with with relation to the transpulmonary pressures with the advanced mode of ventilators yes, that you're talking about, the C5. Yes, uh, and that's where the uh, the uh, esophageal manometer comes in place, where it helps us probably choose the appropriate peep. So this is for, as so you said, important is... Times, so 72 times in a minute, sir. That, that's what they are saying. Yes, sir. And so the whole idea is that so we can't be mo modifying our ventilation strategies every now and then for every time that the pressure changes. The whole idea, what he elaborated was safe ventilation. And that's the crux of uh, these advantages of these new ventilators, where we can probably... Uh, avoid the damage by giving the appropriate peep and keeping the ventilation as minimum as possible and try to see if we can get them into the weaning stage as early as possible. So that's where these ventilators probably help us. With this. What about the second question, sir? Instead of prone question, what is your experience on reverse standalone breath position? There are certain articles. Reverse standalone breath position. But this this was a little bit of a... Uh, uh, in fact, uh, one... One German scientist came up with an idea that, that Trendelenburg says better is a reverse one and it re reduces your aspiration sort of way. But this idea has not been accepted there. So we'll stick to the uh, general idea of it. And uh, what about your comment on Sepsivax or Mycobacterium W in gram negative as well as? It has not worked well, sir, because it was uh, quite very uh, sort of uh, generalized concept which was tried a. There are a lot of vaccines, in fact, uh, recurrent uh, ICU admissions, they have tried with Pseudomonas vaccines. It's not for other vaccines, for it has not worked well, sir. As a therapy, sir. Uh, yeah, it's because the bacteria is very commonly change their antigenic structure. So, and, and, and who would be the recipients? How frequently will you give that? What is the induced, uh, uh, your... Uh, uh, passive immunity that uh, the active immunity would be generating how long that immunity will last so these are all public health policies that also eventually will come crop into just so, to add yes to add to what dr arindam said uh, these are the various immunomodulators that have been uh, used during covid and the post covid time but this was based out of a study from again from the public sector hospitals uh, uh, and the lead investigator was from PGI Chandigarh. This was the only immunomodulator in the Indian study which had suggested a mortality benefit uh, with Mycobacterium vecchi. But yes, similar benefits have been observed in this as well as the others. Uh, these are the predominantly back, for yeah. uh, gram negative. But you know, the, the, they all have a, a certain place. And the idea why I asked that question was 
the there are only a subset of patients who would probably benefit out of this uh, non uh, or the other therapies that are being discussed and we'll have to figure out which are those patients which probably will benefit everybody if you give it for everybody it may not have the same benefit and we may find it as useless as uh, as uh, uh, you know is being discussed so but yes there is a role for the, all these molecules and there's a place we just are probably not there in terms of identifying the right set of patients thank you sir now we have with us uh, professor manpreet singh from gmc 32 sir please it was very nice talk dr arindam i want to ask only one simple question what is your experience about aprv mode of ventilation because we are using that mode for the last two years off and on on the thesis basis let's uh, we just define two theses that comparison of different modes of ventilation so that uh, but not in ards so i sir, want to ask sir, what is in aprv question? again this this is more of a uh, inverse ratio we are using almost uh most of the patients most of the patients you are on an a but aprv we have uh, uh, reliance is no short of your uh, uh, resources right do you ask anything everything is there so but we are using it very sparsely by the time to be honest if you say so by the time that much of rescue is required where you have given uh, protective lung ventilation ultra protective you have prone the patient you have given inverse ratio you are paralyzed and the patient is not getting better so when ecmo was not there aprv or hfov this were your next levels your the ultimate levels or maybe in nitric oxide but now with an ecmo when before covid there were only i think 15 20 centers were doing ecmo in india itself i was only the person in in entire eastern india doing ecmo and during covid it came up to almost 150 yes. almost every hospital do have an ecmo and people got trained and all this part so people are not going to that aprv level so before going into that they are considering on ecmo itself which is not a bad idea if you have a reversible situation particularly uh, sort of bacterial pneumonia which you know the patient would be reverted not like a second wave i think uh, nah, nah. but aprv if properly understood and properly delivered can nah. but the problem is that sir neither you or me would be at the bedside we would be somewhere here like here right <laughs> so that, that 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 would be the problem to percolate the knowledge at the bedside and to have all the nursing people all the junior <laughs> residents to understand what is happening on the aprv that is the biggest problem sir thank you otherwise sir. it's 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 a good one sir thank you sir so there are these questions from the online uh, viewers so there's this question from dr nungdan to uh, pungdan nufal from nepal kathmandu he asks can we use uh, we at this vip in patients with ards with sepsis with sepsis yes there is no contraindication on that okay so next question sir question again from dr tridip chatterji from maharashtra mumbai he asks Uh, any role of lactate as lactate as a guide in in this treatment lactate serum lactate level as a guide in this treatment any role i don't think so amita you want to no okay. no that is more for uh, uh, the tissue perfusion related issues and hypotension or vasopressor related not related to ards next question from dr thigla vathi from tamil nadu chennai how to determine the phenotypes where ap- vip can be used uh, that's an uh, that's an interesting question uh, in fact i have skipped that slide where they have now divided ards into hypo inflammatory and hyper inflammatory phenotypes obviously the hyper inflammatory phenotypes the base you can pretty well understand that they they secrete more inflammatory cytokines more biotraumas and all others so most of your therapeutic interventions in terms of ventilation has worked well there but i think before uh, sort of generalizing that hyper inflammatory uh, uh, situations the abiptadil and other things will work better we need to look into and in, in, in very minute details not only uh, abiptadil a lot of and i am i am i am telling you uh, i am i am working with uh, reliance life sciences on biologics right reliance is almost developing 
more than 30 different biologics, the highest in India, followed by the other company, an Indian company, which are also doing well. The future is on the biologics itself, right? The monoclonal antibodies and how your the the toll-like receptors or different receptors your, your uh, are, are being modulated on that. So one possibilities are also they are not only abiptadil. Maybe our industry friends will bring on a lot of good monoclonal antibody which can modify the response. Obviously, the hyperinflammatory it makes sense. The general sense it tells that that it, the benefit would be more on hyperinflammatory, but no specific trial has been done on that part. Sir, next question is from Dr. Deeraj Malik from Delhi, from New Delhi. He's asking, can this VIP be used along with steroids? Along with steroids. There had been no contraindication on that. So if you see the study protocol, the standard of care in, has included steroid itself. And obviously, the basic rule applies not before seven days, not after 14 days. So a lot of patients in both that arm, in control and as well as your intervention arm, has equivalently got uh, steroids itself. There is no difference on that. Case. So, sir, I'll just take a few more <laughs> questions. There are so many. Uh, from Dr. Tapan Sarkar from West Bengal, Kolkata, he's asking, does Aviptadil increase type 2 pneumos, uh, pneumatocytes? In number? No, expression of uh, type 2 pneumocytes in little bit of numbers, but more whatever are there, they produce surfactants more. So it, it uh, sort of incites the type 2 pneumocytes to produce surfactants. That is more important action of habit. So I will uh, end this, uh, stop taking these further online thing, but I'll end on this. This is a message from Dr. Atri Gangopadhyay from uh, Jharkhand, Rachi. He's a CCI East Zone Governor and right. I think he's also executive member of ISCCM okay. from Ranchi. He says, excellent learning from both the speakers, my highest regard and appreciation. Thanks from our end also on that part. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you so Thanks. much. It was an excellent presentation and an absolute pleasure to learn from you. May I please request Dr. N.H. Krishna, sir, to please come forward and Dr. Amutha also to please felicitate Dr. Arindam. Now, I, I have a question before I go in. So, if you really don't like a presentation, how do you say that? Uh -huh. Sir, less logins, but we had already 800. No, how do you, the organizers, say that? I think the fact that it was. No, I'll tell you, if it is not a good presentation, we'll tell. Wow, that is a brilliant presentation. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, that is how you say it. Thank you. But sir, you skipped the phenotype, phenotype slide. No, Somebody you picked the it up. But the it. audience picked it up. The slides is here. I will share it. But the audience picked it up. So that shows that they were attentive. Ha, they were def definitely attentive. And that was a brilliant presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Welcome to the CCA family. Yes. Hi. Please. <laughs> Thank you, sir. May I request Dr. Krishna, Dr. Arindam, and Dr. Mutha to please felicitate our chairpersons for the session, Dr. Amit Mandal, sir. Dr. Agam, please. <laughs> May I request Dr. Agam, Dr. Arindam, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Mutha to please felicitate Dr. Deepak Bhaseen. Thank you so much, sir. 
may I now request Dr. Robin Gupta to come forward. I request Dr. N.H. Krishna and Dr. Agam Vora to please felicitate our CCI Pulmonology Up Practice Update coordinators. First of all, inviting Dr. Robin Gupta to please come forward. May I please request um, the rest of the coordinators to come forward? Doc Dr. Sanjit Vadva, please. Dr. Raupali Lahoria, Dr. Vishal Sharma, Dr. Rahul Katyal, Dr. Kamaljeet Singh, and Dr. Nikhil Gupta. May I request Dr. Arindam to come forward, please? Dr. Rupali Lahoria. Dr. Nikhil Gupta. Okay, Dr. Krishna, so I'm not going to get away. I'll just call my, I'll, I know who he was. Dr. Kavaljeet Singh. Dr. Rahul Katyal. May I please? Achha. I would also like uh, to invite Dr. Kirit. <laughs> now, may I request Dr. Agambora and Dr. Arindam to be joined by Dr. S.S. Sibia? Physician, senior physician from Ludhiana with over 45 years of experience, known as the father of preventive cardiology, pioneer in introducing a series of non invasive cardiology treatments in India, to please felicitate CCI founder, trustee, chairman, Dr. N.H. Krishna. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Krishna, sir, for being here with us for bringing pulmonologists all over the world and country together. <laughs> for bringing to us the beautiful garland that is CCI. May I also request Dr. Vora, Dr. Arindam, Dr. Sibya to felicitate Dr. Amutha Kumar Ramasamy. Sir is... Uh, you know, we really salute his endeavors in creating the largest chain of rural and urban intensive care units in Tamil Nadu, which is recognized nationally and internationally. And he's bringing it to the north as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. N.H. Krishna, Dr. Amutha Kumar, Dr. Agam, Dr. Arindam for being here with us. A big, big applause for sir.
Now, may I request Dr. Robin Gupta to step forward for a vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the organizing team, it's my privilege to propose a word of thanks on this occasion. Uh, I express my gratitude and respect uh, for our uh, distinguished uh, chairperson and uh, president, uh, Dr. Krishna, and our speakers, Dr. Agam Vora and uh, Dr. Kar, and uh, our uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Deepak Agarwal, Dr. Zafar, Dr. Mandal, and uh, Dr. Deepak Basin for sparing their valuable time, but also not only for sparing their valuable time, but also for enlightening us uh, with their uh, uh, beautiful lectures and commendable uh, speaks. And uh, thank you all.